spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX, and we're back with Morn Money, Morn Problems. Ah, yeah, yeah. How are you, Karen? <laughs> I'm excellent. I'm very glad to see you. So you leave SMWX for a while, and then there is an entire arrest warrant issued for the former president, like... What's going on? Look, I don't want to say I had anything to do with it because I didn't. I was in Vietnam, but obviously it's a big story and it's yeah. vital that we unpack how in some ways this is not such a big deal and in other ways it's a really big deal. For sure, for sure. So we did five things you needed to understand about the Ramaphosa versus Mkwebane battle. Now we're going to give you five things you need to understand about this Zuma arrest warrant and everything that's going on around it. So let's start with number one. And you're always so good at this because I'm like, after, <laughs> after I have these conversations, I'm the smartest person at the dinner table. So, oh, thanks, and, and our subscribers, someone left a comment. Thanks a lot for leaving that comment, by the way. They were like, I feel so smart after I watched this. I was like, that's what we're hoping to do. Absolutely. Um, okay, so in Peter Maritzburg, there was a case and there was this arrest warrant issued. Can you tell us like what, what this case was and, and why everyone was in court in the first place? Like, what's the context? Jacob Zuma is facing charges related to, you know, a case that was essentially, it's, it's 15 years old. Um, you know, Shabir Sheikh, his former financial advisor, was convicted in 2005 of corrupting him and then soliciting a bribe from French arms company Thales in order to get Jacob Zuma's political support uh, for Thales in any kind of arms deal inquiry. Jacob Zuma, of course, bringing a permanent stay of prosecution application that failed. It was dismissed by the court. And the court saying... It's, it's when you say, essentially, this case was unduly delayed. His case is, I should have been put on trial with Shabir Sheikh. Mm. 15 years down the line, I'm not going to be able to remember things. Um, you know, that basically they ran the Sheikh trial as a dry run um, for a prosecution against me, which was incredibly unfair. This is unlawful and unconstitutional. The spy tapes recordings, which were what got the case against him withdrawn in 2009, clearly show what I've always said, that there was undue political interference from the Tabo and Becky camp in my prosecution, and that it's just simply untenable for this case to continue. Hmm. He made those arguments. Arguments, three, three judges in the Peter Maritzburg High Court kicking them out and saying, look, there's no basis. You can raise these kind of issues in your trial when you go on trial, right. but this case must, be, uh, must proce be proceeded with. These are such serious charges that it would be not in the interest of justice for this case not to proceed. Mm. So this is the case. And he was meant to appear in court, I think, on the 4th of February mm. so that the case could be postponed. Um, where, you know, he's obviously attempting to appeal the dismissal of um, his permanent stay of prosecution application. Right. High Court refused him leave. He has petitioned the Supreme Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court of Appeal still needs to decide what it's doing. So, in other words, he was just meant to be in court for a postponement. But because it's a criminal mm. case, okay. he needs to be there. Mm. So, if you're an accused person and the court tells you you've got to be in court, you've got to be in court unless you can provide, you know, evidence that the court accepts that you have a valid, mm. justified reason for not being there. Okay, so I suspect this is where all hell breaks loose, right? Because then Twitter went crazy and we heard that the president is going to be arrested soon. And then it turned out there was an arrest warrant for the president. Can you explain what actually happened there? And is it as big a deal as it's been made out to be? Or is it normal? Um, where do we stand with this arrest warrant thing? Look, in the course of the criminal justice system, not a big deal. I've been to a number of criminal cases where accused people haven't rocked up and an arrest warrant has been issued for them, but it's been suspended, which is what happened in the case of Jacob Zuma. So okay. his next court appearance is on the 6th of May. Um, it's not like the court immediately said, no, this man must be arrested. He He's not even out on bail. He's out on warning. So he didn't have to play, pay bail. There's an acceptance by the court that, you know, at this point that he will stand his trial. So, you know, he wasn't required, um, you know, in terms of going and getting medical treatment overseas to even really get permission from the NPA or the court or anything because he's out on warning. Mm. So this arrest warrant was issued. It's more, you know, I think it's a big deal because of who he is. Mm. And I mean, obviously, this is the former president of the country. Um, you know, it will be a case of oh, how the mighty have fallen. Mm. But I think that this story is going to have a lot of legs and it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out when he does return to court on the 6th of May. Definitely. And, and take us through how not necessarily former President Zuma himself, but those who support him have responded to this arrest warrant and turned it into 
something of a political football. Obviously, we had the tweet with uh, former President Zuma. I don't know what gun this was. Apparently, it was like to shoot birds or something in Ganja. Yes. Um, so he tweeted mysteriously, but then his supporters have also kind of, you know, jumped on this arrest warrant and, and turned it into um, something of quite political, quite major political import. Maybe this comes in the context of Jacob Zuma and his followers having a very um, adverse view of the courts. You know, I mean, in, in when I've spoken to him, for instance, he's said that, you know, the cases involving him always go one way and one way only. Mm. Um, and so he's not someone who has a particularly charitable view of the courts. And the courts do not have a particularly charitable view of him. His entire presidency was littered with the corpses of his failed court battles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he, he and his supporters, yeah, he and his supporters um, are very, very critical of the judiciary and what they perceive to be as a bias against them. The court, of course, saying that under the rules, whether it was Spy Tapes case and Kandla, all of these matters, you know, they demonstrably applied the law and he simply failed to make his case. But that being as it may, it has become an issue. It has, you know, sort of seen as something that was not justified in the circumstances. And it enters a particular minefield, which is his medical condition. Mm, mm. Um, and, you know, we know that this is something that's come up before. In the Zondo inquiry, for example, yeah. he said he was, his lawyer said he was unable to appear because he was receiving medical treatment or he was unwell or hospitalized. Um, we don't know what that, that status is. He has said in an affidavit to, to the Zondo inquiry that it is a very serious undisclosed medical condition and it's a matter of national security that he you know, should never be required to disclose in an open forum. He has invited the Deputy Chief Justice to go and meet with his military doctor, who appears to be the same person who provided the now notorious sick note that uh, Judge Daya Pele refused to accept and said was contradictory hmm. um, in, in the Peter Maritzburg High Court. So this issue of Jacob Zuma's health is something that is shown up at the Zondo inquiry. It's showing up at his trial. And it is a potential minefield because obviously people have the rights to confidentiality. But at the same hmm. time, everyone is equal before the law. And if you require to appear before an inquiry or you're required to, uh, required to appear in court, mm. you do need to take the necessary steps to give the court a reasonable assurance that the reasons that you're giving for your non-appearance right. are valid. That's why when this thing uh, goes back to court on the 6th of May, mm. we could see quite profound fireworks depending on how his lawyers choose to respond to this. But I very much expect major drama when this thing goes back to court. And where does this claim that this is like an apartheid case come from? Is that Zuma's legal team responding to this or how did that arise? That was in, that was in papers fi he filed in reply mm. to the state's response to his bid to attempt the dismissal of the permanent stay. Okay. So the state have said, basically, you know, you can raise these issues in court. If you say that, you know, there's been, that there's some kind of aspect of this case that is tainted, that you can't remember things because it's 15 years down the line, all of these things can be raised in court. You know, there's nothing stopping you. But the case that we have against you is very, very paper-based. We have an updated forensic report which shows all the payments you received from Shabir Sheikh, um, which Sheikh at the time contended, you know, we're part of a revolving loan agreement or gifts or whatever. Court in that, in the high court didn't accept that. But they're saying, look, we've got enough to present a case, face the case, and if you've suffered these prejudices, you can raise it in the trial. And if the trial doesn't accept it, you can appeal. Um, Jacob Zuma is saying that he will never get a fair trial because of the prosecutorial mis, uh, misconduct that he alleges the NPA is guilty. Of course, they absolutely deny that. Um, and therefore, this case must now be stopped. What's interesting is that in his permanent stay of application case, he, call, he said about the lead prosecutor in the case against him, Billy Downer, that, mm -hmm. quote unquote, he hated him. And that he was driven by hatred to pursue the case. And also, quote unquote, that he was, you know, nostalgic for the days of apartheid era prosecutions. He was forced to strike that out from his, from his affidavit. Muzi Sikakani is advocate withdrawing those claims after the state bought a striking out application against him, which is when you basically erase all that stuff from the court record. Um, but now those allegations have resurfaced in his affidavit in reply to the state saying basically footsack to your, right, you right. know, to your appeal bid. Um, and he's saying that the state, you know, demonstrates they are reminiscent of, of apartheid 
prosecutors. So right. we have to see how the state responds to that. Okay, great. So we've covered three bases. We've looked at what the context of this case was. We've looked at how this whole arrest warrant came about. And then we've also looked at the response of former President Zuma. What do you think happens next? You've alluded to the 6th of May. How does the next phase of this court battle play out? Well, essentially, there's two phases to this. First of all, we don't know if Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo has, in fact, met with Jacob Zuma's doctor, mm. which was the offer that was extended to him. Mm. We know that, for instance, his lawyers gave, the, gave Zondo the contact details for the doctor and said, you can arrange this interaction. Mm. But that is walking into a little bit of a minefield for him because even if he is told what the condition is and how serious it is, there's no way he can publicly disclose that. Mm. Um, so I think the Zuma legal team played a little bit of a masterstroke in terms of that because mm. in publicly agreeing to meet this doctor, I think Zondo may have misstepped somewhat because, mm. you know, that information is confidential and now he's literally going to be in a position where he either accepts it and then has to say to the South African public, by the way, you know, I can't tell you why he's not here, mm. but he's not going to be here and I accept it. Or he has to say, I disagree with this. Yeah. And then you're not a doctor. You didn't have your own experts. Mm. It, it mm. is a minefield, yeah. a minefield, yeah. minefield, minefield. In the criminal case, his lawyers now know that the judge doesn't accept the, mm. the evidence that they've placed before her. Um, you know, they have the option to bring, you know, a more circumspect kind of sick note. Or they may decide to take the fight um, further. I think, you know, the the doctor in question is in is a, in a, a military doctor, has been looking after Jacob Zuma for quite some time, was quite an instrumental figure in the alleged 2014 poisoning saga. Hmm. Um, and, you know, we don't know if the lawyers will then say to the judge, well, you can meet with the doctor, make a similar offer to Zondor. But hmm. it is very, very up in the air. And it has, you know, if... Everyone involved in this is not careful. It can it can devolve into something that Jacob Zuma's uh, supporters will use to argue that this is further evidence of his victimization. Mm -hmm. It may paint Judge Zondor into a bit of a corner, um, or it may end up, you know, exonerating the president, the former president. We don't know. It's 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 really, really, really a very delicate situation, um, and. We know that the, pres the former president is very reluctant to disclose what exactly his health condition is. It's been rumored to be the consequence of a poisoning. But we also know that the NPA, when it made a decision on whether Mantuli Zuma should be prosecuted for this alleged poisoning, said there wasn't any evidence that it even happened. So, I, so I, yeah. And I think here some nuance is necessary because Absolutely. it may well be the case that President sick. Zuma is not well. And I've seen some people, which I think is a bit distasteful. Look, I've never been um, President Zuma's biggest fan. But at the same time, he may be unwell. No, he's same... definitely not well. I right, mean, we've right. seen it, you know, and this has a, been a recurrent thing. In 2014, it was reported to the extent where like Guede Mantasha and a lot of people were coming out and saying, look, you know, he has these issues. Mm. The Sunday Times at the time reported that he may have some kind of heart condition. There was all this speculation. Mm. He looked visibly frail. This is the same time where he um, now, it now appears, believes that he was poisoned in 2014 mm. um, and received treatment in Russia. And we know that this is, you know, that this was this was identified as the cause. But as I said before, NPA is saying that there wasn't any real medical evidence that he had, in fact, been poisoned. Mm -hmm. Those close to him remained adamant that he was. Um, but when he was interviewed by Tuli Madansela for state of capture, he was coughing. He was unwell. When I spoke to him at the permanent stay of prosecution case, he was coughing. He was unwell. When he was at the um, Zondo Commission, he was coughing. He was unwell. To be honest, when I spoke to him, he wasn't particularly well. Either. He's a 79-year-old man. He's a type 2 diabetic. They're clearly... And I think the thing is, is that this entire situation in which he finds himself where he's facing legal bills of, you know, and, and, and Kandla repayment, loan repayments of like some 30 million rand. He's looking at the potential of a 25 year jail term. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, he has still got pockets of supporters, but, you know, he's literally facing litigation to pay his kids school fees. Mm. 
um, he's not in a good situation. If you're going to be under stress, this is this is quite debilitating stress. So it's not, I don't think anyone could suggest, I think anyone who's seen him and will be in around him, I don't think you can make an argument that he's faking this. But it is, you know, it's it's what is the nature of this illness and is it so so serious that it's going to be it's going to he's going to be unable to participate in his criminal trial or unable to participate in the Zondo inquiry mm -hmm. because there's another third option that if Jacob Zuma's lawyers feel that they've been pushed to the end of all of this they may well rock up at the Zondo inquiry with the man looking very unwell in a wheelchair mm -hmm. and what does that mean publicly mm -hmm. so you know, I don't think that it's fair to say that he's faking this. I just think that, you know, we don't know enough at this point. And because he has the right to privacy, um, we may never know exactly, specifically and, and, and on record what the situation is. But I do not think it's fair to say yeah. that he's, he's faking it. Sure. Well, let's come to, to the final question that I think we need to think about here. And that is, what are the stakes here? And you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but like, how important is this trial for South African politics as a whole. Because just when you say that, like, former President Zuma could be going to jail. Like, and it's, it, that's gonna send shockwaves throughout, or even if he's not, it'll also send shockwaves. So how do you see the stakes in this, in this trial? My personal perception has been like, at the moment, South Africa is trying to, you know, understand where it is, find itself, and like, find people to blame for the situation in which we find ourselves. Jacob Zuma, you know, if you look to the evidence of the Shabir Sheikh case, there was, you know, there was manifest problematic behavior. I mean, he's always said, look, it was a loan. It was a revolving. I was trying to help BE. That's why I went and interceded for him. Um, I think he does make a valid point when he says he should have been put on trial with Sheikh. I think that if that had happened, the entire course of South Africa's history would have been very, very different. And there would have been finalization, there would have been accountability. The NPA has always insisted that they, at that stage, made a very, you know, Bulalani Nguka made a very um, specific and educated uh, decision about, you know, what, what should happen. He said that he feared the consequences of, like, sort of mass social upheaval and violence if they charged the uh, uh, Zuma and, you know, the case sort of fell apart and, you know, he just did not feel comfortable at that stage with charging him. But um, in many respects, you know, that this is an attempt to to claw back a history that could have been very different if different decisions had been made. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see when this case, if and when it goes ahead. You know, you're talking about events that took place in the late 1990s, mm. the arms deal, you know, which was the first big sort of corruption scandal, alleged corruption scandal that South Africa ever went through. And I think it's a lesson in, you know, is it is it possible to to go back and to try and undo and to try and get some form of accountability? He's, of course, said that, you know, the the real people that need to answer about the arms deal are people like Tabo and Becky, um, who, who he contends was the person who was actually responsible for shutting down a potential special investigating unit investigation into the arms deal. And so all those those small and yana, not so small and yana skeletons are going to come out. But um, in some ways, there's a there's an optics to it, because yeah, if if yeah. if like you say, had Jacob Zuma been put on trial 15 years ago or, you know, 18 years ago when he was in his late 50s or 60s, mm. sprightly, up for the fight, you know, it may have felt a little bit more fair than it now does. But many people will say this person was responsible for the disintegration of this country. He was at the helm of all this so-called state capture corruption. He needs to face the music. Um, and it's really a question of can you blame one person, one family, one group of individuals for everything that's gone wrong? Or is that simply a convenient elastoplast to a gaping wound of seismic corruption that has defined how we've been running for things for quite some time? Um, and it's it's not necessarily honest to to say that we one person is solely responsible for all of that. And it also seems to me that, so you've got the corruption arms deal shake stuff, and then you've got the state capture stuff from the sort of latter part of the presidency. And those processes are all coming to a head mm -hmm. at a similar time. You've got the state capture stuff at the Zondo Commission, and who knows what could flow from that if prosecutions are suggested 
that may implicate the president or not. But in any case, he has to go to the commission, maybe again, maybe not. And you've got this corruption trial happening, and they're all kind of converging in one time. Yeah, I mean, it's understandable why, you know, he's not in a particularly good place. Yeah, I mean. um, and I think, again, it's an optics thing that, you know, if you've, you know, he was at the helm of a lot of very adverse decisions for the country, a lot of things that were seriously, if not legally questionable, then definitively ethically questionable. But, you know, it's, I think it will be a cop out to try and say that everything that went wrong was because of him. And I think that's the difficulty now that we find ourselves in. Um, and unfortunately, the dynamic of uh, South African politics is that you're continuously being asked to take sides. You've got to be Team JZ or Team Ramaphosa, and never the twain shall meet. Mm. When in fact, even though the twain met, yeah, in one administration, in one administration, and and both of them are human beings that made good and bad decisions. And I think a lot of the nuance is lost. And I think this this issue with Zuma's health and how it manifests itself and how the public responds on a human level to the sight of this this individual, you know, potentially getting wheeled into a commission or wheeled into a courtroom or, you know, facing an arrest warrant or going to jail. Mm. Um, I think that's going to say a lot about us as a, a country and where we are, because I think there is a kind of growing just quiet around that. And unfortunately, we, we are in an environment now where if you express even a modicum of kind of empathy or say, you know, this is not, this is actually, this is a kind of quite tragic scenario for all of us. Um, it's seen as, as being somewhat supportive of corruption, which I, I don't, I don't think it is at all. Well, uh, Karen, thanks so much for joining us again on SMWX. Your insights are always incisive and insightful. And uh, you can catch Karen Morn. She's the legal journalist at Diesel Black Star, uh, a legal journalist there, fantastic. Also catch her on Newsroom Africa, but mostly just catch her on SMWX. Aye, yeah, yeah. Aye, Like, share, subscribe, keep growing the channel, spread it with all your friends, and let's keep spreading this fire. You need to call me more, more money, more, more problems. More money? More problems. More problems. Thank you. More money <laughs> we talk about, the more problems we see. Thanks for watching the content. Like, share, and subscribe on all platforms. smwx.co.za to join the WhatsApp channel. And let's build a new conversation for a new generation. Are you, are you?